Good morning. Again, it's my pleasure to discuss with you the issues of renal transplantation update. And this is a second presentation of this series, which included five lectures. I started the first one on introduction and outcome. And this is the second one about the update of renal transplant immunology. The corners of this sector will include introduction, risk factors for uh, Im immunological and development of uh, donor-specific antibodies, donor-specific antibody classification and values, uh, what about the differential types of donor-specific antibody and the types of acute antibody rejection, how to optimize the interpretation of the DSA, what about the non-traditional and non-HLA antibodies, and I'll end with guidelines, desensitization, and closure aspects. Let us go to the first sector, which is introduction. I'd like to start the journey of immunology by giving a hint about the HLA or major histocompatibility complex system. This is a collection of more than 200 genes on chromosome 6P includes HLA proteins. The two group of MHC genes relevant to transplantation are class one and class two. Class one uh, measure histocompatibility uh, genes include HLA-A, HLA-B, HLA-C produce class one MHC molecules which have two polypeptide chains, alpha uh, polymorphic uh, alpha chain and an invariable beta-2 microglobulin chains, usually three alpha and one beta-2 microglobulin. Plus one HLA variability result from the peptide binding region, the alpha-1 and the alpha-2 domains. Class one HLA proteins are expressed. This is a very important point to be put in mind because HLA class one HLA proteins are expressed on the surface of nearly every nucleated cells in the body. They, there are nine primary MHC class two genes, HLA the P1, DB1. Uh, so we have HLA the P A1 and the P1, HLA the Q A1 and the P1, HLA the RA, HLA the R. B1, B3, B4, and B5. These class two molecules also consist of two chains, alpha and beta, with class HLA variability in the peptide binding region of the alpha one and beta one domains. Class two HLA proteins are expressed on engine presenting cells, such as macrophages, beta cell, and dendritic cells. HLA protein is expressed from two alleles with a high degree of HLA genetic polymorphism. So these are, this is a, a, a nice idea about the HLA genes and HLA proteins to be put in mind. If we look at the, the data and the registry, this regarding the classic HLA mismatch because we have one chromosome from father and one chromosome from mother. So usually we have two chromosomes and we look at HLA A, HLA B, HLADRP1. So we have three uh, products from the father and from mother. So usually the match is from zero to six between the couple, between the recipient and donor. And this is a distribution of mismatch for both diseased kidney transplantation and living transplantation. If you look here, this is zero mismatch. This means that the uh, recipient and donor are compatible are um, compatible all six uh, engines. This is one mismatch. Two mismatch, the frequency and the percentage of mismatch for uh, two, three HLA mismatch, four mismatch, five mismatch, and six mismatch. In our center, at Urology and Nefru Center in Mansoura, we don't accept six mismatch. At least there should be a matching in the, the R Lucas. So the maximum mismatch that we may accept is five by sex mismatch. Regarding the screening methods, this is the how to uh, screen for antibody because this is very important. If the recipient has antibodies against the HLA engine, the donor, 
this is very critical because this may lead to hyperacute rejection, the catastrophic end that uh, uh, in the era of immunology lab we don't see uh, nowadays. So if you look here for A, this is uh, the A uh, cell-based platform incorporate panel of lymphocytes from the potential donor pool with each donor's cell contained in a single well. Uh, this is in the cell-based uh, sector of this figure. Conversely, solid phase has purified here, the purified HLA engine bound to surface of a bead or other solid phase, other solid phase not shown in the figure. So, so this is the A. In B, here we have the uh, serum mixed with cells, here with the cells or with beads. And if antibody is specific to the HLA engines present, uh, present it will bind. In the C uh, aspect of the, figure, of the figure, the reagents used to detect antibody binding are complement. Here in the cell compartment, the complement is used uh, for cell-based assays and fluorescently labeled conjugated anti-IgG for solid phase bead uh, based assay. In D, uh, the complement in the D, complement uh, activation in the presence of a bound antibody results in cell death that is seen via a vital dye. So when we add vital dye, we can uh, see the, this uh, interaction. The percentage of wells donors that demonstrate cell death estimate DBRA, binary active antibody in cell-based assays. For solid phase assays, the mean fluorescence intensity uh, of the beads is measured. MFI, mean fluorescence intensity, is one parameter used to determine if a bead is classified as positive. In screening assays, uh, the percentage of uh, positive beads determine the binary active antibody. In single engine bead assays, the antibody specificities of the beads that are positive are analyzed with a BRA calculator of donor HLA phenotype to estimate the calculated or CBRA. So again, we have cell based and a solid phase, and as you see, the reagent in each screening test is completely different. In the cell based, we need complement incubation and to look at the cell death. And here we don't uh, look at cells because the beads um, uh, are bound to specific HLA, and if the antibody is present, we will find a positive mean fluorescence intensity uh, that may be further specified by single engine B to know the specificities of antibody. Regarding the cross-match method, the cross-match method a cell specific to a single potential donor are mixed with recipient serum. If the SA are present, if donor specific antibody are present, they will bind to the cells. So this is the here the, the mix. So this is a complement dependent cytotoxicity. And this is the flow cytometry uh, cross match. So, in the cell based, uh, in both the uh, CDC and the flow cytometry depends upon the donor lymphocytes. And the patient serum is added to, uh, to the test. Anti human globulin uh, may be added to increase the safety of the CDC. Anti human globulin is added to CDC to enhance CDC uh, reaction. Fluorescent conjugated in the flow cytometry, fluorescent conjugate anti-human IG is added in the flow cytometry methods. And in the C, detection uh, of antibody in the AHG, anti-human globulin enhanced CDC method is dependent on a complement binding resulting in cell lysis that is visible with the addition of vital dye, as I mentioned before. In the flow cytometry uh, method, Cells with donor specific antibody and fluorescent antibody bound are counted upon passage through a flow cytometer. A positive uh, AHG 
CDC cross match is determined when a significant percentage of cells uh, is observed to be lysed on microscope. So here, this is the steps of the CDC cross match: adding cells of the donor to the patient serum, and then adding complement, allowing this to for incubation, and then if there is antibody specific to the donor cells, this antibodies will uh, lead to the lysis after addition of complement, and the cell lysis can be detected under the microscope. But in the flu cytometry cross match, the uh, reaction is reported human fluorescence on the donor cell is significantly higher than negative control, and here you can find the channel shift. So this is the way of interpretation of the cross match. Again, in panoreactive antibodies, there is no specific donor, but here there is a specific donor cells. So cross match is crucial. So the uh, positive CDC cross match against T lymphocytes is a contraindication for transplantation, except if we uh, have a desensitization to allow successful transplantation. So the highest risk, immunologic risk, is the high positive CDC uh, cross match against T lymphocytes. So regarding the BRA at the time of transplantation, according to the data, you can uh, you can look here for the adult living. This is a, the percentage, either less than one percent, one to two percent, twenty to uh, one to twenty, twenty to eighty, eighty to ninety, ninety, eight to hundred percent. So you can find the fraction percentage according to the data of that was published early this year. Another terminology which is DPRA, delta BRA. What's meant by delta BRA is to compare, is to compare the peak percentage of the BRA before the first transplant and before the second transplant. If the first one fails and the patient is prepared for the second, if the difference is exceeding 10%, this is critical delta BRA. So in this study. A retrospective evaluation of 140 adult patients who received a second kidney transplant recipient and uh, an donor characteristics are analyzed and they defined here the delta BRA as the difference between peak BRA before this, the first and the second transplant by more than 10 percent and here if you look here the uh, increasing delta BRA above 10 percent is associated with acute rejection and lower survival and the tissue type being mismatch. And as you see here, the delta BRA above 10% is correlating with and increasing the odds ratio for acute rejection. So this, all these are parameters for immunological testing. Another important point is the pregnancy induced sensitization promotes sex disparity in living uh, donor kidney transplantation. Although we know that pregnancy is one of the reasons of sensitization, like blood transfusion, pregnancy, infection, etc. But this is the very nice report about 2,587 candidates of transplantation to address the issue of, of sex. Does men have a better chance for transplantation? Here, if you look here, the uh, incompatibility with living a donor with more one more than one donor here you can find here men nine percent and in women thirty percent and I think pregnancy is a formidable means a severe biological barrier for women and contributes uh, unequally to sex disparity and live kidney transplantation. This is why this is one of the factors why women uh, find difficultly uh, difficultly find their compatible donors. So all these variables to be put in mind while we are addressing the issue of compatibility. Another interesting point, if there is incompatibility, the incompatibility may be in HLA typing or maybe in the ABO system. Usually a live donor kidney transplantation, we accept the uh, typical blood group or O can give A or B and the AB, especially if it's A and B can receive kidney from all. This is the crude rules of the transplantation. But what's meant by each uh, ABO incompatibility like giving 
a, a recipient blood group A, a kidney from B. This is a very difficult issue. And in either the presence of donor specific antibody against HLA antigen or the presence of antibodies against the EPO system to proceed successfully in kidney transplantation, we need desensitization. This study addresses the issue of HLA incompatibility and ABO incompatibility. And this is, was a, nation, a nationwide cohort study to investigate the impact of anti-AB and the donor specific anti-HLA DSA antibodies on the clinical outcomes in kidney transplant recipients. The, the patients are classified uh, into four groups, transplant from ABO incompatible donors, transplant in recipient with HLA DSA, HLA incompatible uh, couple, and from combined ABO and HLA incompatible uh, couple, and the control group, this will be uh, compatible for both ABO and HLA. The incidence of pulps prove an acute reaction was higher in the uh, in HLA incompatible and ABO uh, and ABO incompatible and HLA incompatible. So in the group of HLA incompatible or in the group of ABO incompatible plus HLA incompatible relative to the control. In contrast, it wasn't higher in ABO incompatible group. This center graph survival rates didn't differ across four groups. However, relative to control group, patient survival rate was reduced in ABO incompatible and ABO incompatible and Chilean incompatible, and this may be due to the need for desensitization. Uh, so this is a new variant and the multivariate binary logistic analysis for biopsy proven acute rejection. And as you look here, here the uh, incidence of rejection is significantly high in the presence of HLA incompatibility. It seems it is two folds higher here, uh, either non-adjusted or adjusted models. The, here the uh, need for desensitization, again, this is the hazards of patient death. And I th it seems that desensitization is a key player in causation of infection and side effects that may explain partly the higher mortality in incompatible transplantation. Regarding the ABO system, the anti-Chile system, and the presence of Luminex technology that can diagnose donor-specific antibody, this was a very nice study that was published from a urology and nephrology center, and the, this, this was the idea of Professor Hunain. Here, we had 153 uh, patients transplanted with uh, the, their sera before transplant, at the time of transplantation, were preserved at our lab, and then they were transplanted, and the course match was repeatedly negative, and the sera were stored uh, at our lab, and then the patients were followed up for four years, and then they were respectively evaluated their sera at the time of transplantation by luminous technology. We have 104 patients who had no antibodies, and 33 patients uh, had uh, uh, anti-chile antibody but donor non-specific and 16 patients had donor specific antibodies and we found that if uh, e even in patients with repeated negative CDC cross match the presence of donor specific antibody was associated with higher incidence of acute antibody mediated rejection usually occurred within the short period after transplantation as you see 31% of the patients with donor specific antibodies had acute antibody mediated rejection. So this, this is the first point to, uh, to just to address together. So we may have, uh, this is the de novo, what's meant by de novo? De novo means uh, the, at the time of transplantation, there was, there is no anti chile antibodies. And the, the anti chile antibodies are formed later on after transplantation. So de novo means new anti chile antibodies that develop after transplantation and was not present before transplantation. And preformed means present before transplantation. So if there, there is no anti chile antibody before transplantation and after transplantation and sensitization, there is anti chile antibodies, we should ask ourselves if these antibodies that are newly formed after transplantation, non-donor specific, 
or donor specific this is a great difference if the uh, antibodies are not donor specific this uh, as you see here uh, is not associated with worsening the outcome of the graft um, survival but if we have donor specific antibodies especially if the anti chile antibody mean first intensity is high about 3000 or 10000 this adversely affect graft survival so this is the one of interesting point to start with the presence of anti chile antibodies even after transplantation is bad news in transplantation this just to show you that the cumulative number of patients was positive donor specific antibody detection and allograft loss after the renal transplantation in 304 patients the rate of graft loss was 1.6 percent per year this is the rate of uh, graft loss and the uh, rate of the uh, anti chile antibodies so the incidence of anti chile antibodies is 4.8 percent per year and the graft loss is 1.6 percent per year another important issue is the anti chile antibody uh, which is donor specific and present before transplantation does it persist or vanish persistent donor specific antibody is another bad news what are the risk factors for uh, persistence as you see female sex age of trans uh, transplantation uh, less than 50 years preformed anti chile antibodies was high mean fluorescent intensity preformed class 2 uh, induced the donor specific antibody presence of pre-transplant synthesizing event presence of more than one preformed dsa so all these are risk factors for persistence of anti chile antibodies and as you see the uh, multivariate analysis of risk factors for graft, graft loss occurring according to the evolution of dsa after transplantation uh, here as you see it is significantly associated with increasing hazard risk of uh, graft loss so persistence of anti chile antibodies although this study this study included a few number of patients but the issue of persistence means that there is a high immunological uh, phenomena another study showing the uh, the issue of persistence if we have here this is the dsa preform if the all the dsa are lost here the graft allograft survives perfect but if the anti chile antibody persistent uh, this is the uh, bad associated with adverse outcome and as well as the novo dsa so both persistent dsa and the novo dsa development of new dsa after transplantation both of them are bad news another study which more clearly uh, evaluates the issue of persistence or isolated this the study included 708 recipients testing for uh, the de novo DSA this means the anti chile antibody newly formed after transplantation at 1, 3, 6, 9 and 12 months post transplantation every 6 months thereafter and when clinically warranted by the presence of graft dysfunction or suspicious of rejection so we have a lot of testing for evaluation of the presence and persistence of de novo dsa after transplantation all de novo dsa had a main force intensity of greater than 2000 this is a cut of point of positivity at this lab and one of the important conclusion is persistence of de novo dsa resulted in more acute rejection and uh, than a single positive value moreover recipient with longer duration of de novo DSA persistence had an additional increased risk of acute rejection and graft failure and this is the percentage of isolated uh, DSA positive at single point of time and uh, persistent DSA this means the more than one time the DSA is positive you can look at the time after transplantation and the percentage of patients with isolated or persistent de novo DSA and you can see here the difference in the uh, survival here the um, uh, acute rejection sorry risk of acute rejection in isolated 
versus persistence, you can find a great difference between the isolated and the persistent. Persistence of this CA is associated with uh, the uh, increased risk of rejection in this in the left side here in the right side this is a graft loss so again persistence of denovo dsa carries bad news another point is persistence frequent or not frequent means more than 60 percent uh, is it less or more than 60 percent positivity so uh, when we repeat at different times and the repeated uh, is not just uh, two times, but it's more than 60% of the uh, repeated um, tests uh, showed uh, positive or less than 60%. So the uh, presence of more than 60% is associated with higher risk of rejection and higher risk of graft loss as well, as you see in this uh, issue. And the persistence more than 60% uh, occurred at uh, this is the frequency as you see another point if we have flu cytometric cross match and the flu cytometric cross match is negative then the uh, again and again the presence of DSA is trends above 3000 is associated with increasing uh, uh, has a risk of rejection in this multivariate analysis. So again, even if flu cytometric match is negative, the presence of positive donor specific antibodies carry a higher risk for acute rejection and should be put in mind. There's another study showing that the donor specific antibodies may increase the risk of delay graft function. So the risk of delay graft function is twice as high in patients with have, having preformed DSA, uh, as you see in this uh, factor. What are the risk factors for development of uh, donor-specific antibodies? Here, the, uh, this is the issue of blood transfusion after transplantation. 64 percentage, 64, approximately two-thirds of patients in this experience, in this study, need blood uh, transfusion, mostly within the first month after transplantations. So overall, one year incidence of DSA was significantly higher in patients that uh, had undergone transfusion in comparison to patients with no transfusion. Uh, antibody mate rejection occurred more often in the transfusion group. So again, we should combat the issue of blood transfusion after kidney transplantation and to, uh, uh, to know the issue of sensitization related to blood transfusion. Again, even if, if, when we know the issue of uh, DSA or when to predict the DSA, the immune suppression is very important and crucial for prediction and for controlling the DSA. So, if we look at uh, the uh, induction therapy, ATG will be associated with lower DSA in comparison to um, uh, the interleukin 2 receptor antagonist. And the same point, we show uh, the uh, when we have donor specific antibodies better not to think of reduction of calcium inhibitor or even withdrawal because this will be a risky business. So again and again, immune suppression plays a role. Even if we have documented positivity of donor specific antibody, we should strive to have important immune suppressive drugs. Uh, here, uh, if we allow tachylomus level to be less than 5.3, this will affect uh, dr drastically affect the graft survival post DSA detection in comparison to the level between 5.3 and 6.3. Uh, so, again and again, if we document DSA, we shouldn't allow the tachylomas to be low side. It's better to be above 5.3 to uh, protect against rejection. Another interesting point is tachylomas variability because well, I don't like variability at all in everything because variability is non-physiological. The study addresses this issue, and as you see, the coefficient, coefficient of variation of the chrylomas, if it exceeds 30%, this increases the hazard risk of development of donor de novo DSA. So if uh, the presence of high variability may be a predictor and risk for development of DSA. 
what about the classifications and the values of this say a lot of uh, types of this say according to the HLA classes we may have antibody agnostic class 1 HLA A B antibodies this is for class 1 even class 2 DB uh, uh, in this study as you see the presence of antibodies against DB uh, HLA class 2 antigens as you see here it is rarely to have anti DP uh, isolated but in this study you can find the correlation between the presence of DP antibodies and uh, even HLAC antibodies and the occurrence of uh, rejection uh, so uh, it is very nice to look at all antibodies present the DQ antibodies this uh, from class 2 HLA uh, uh, engines if we have uh, antibodies against DQ this is the number of patient different studies and this is the percentage may range between 5 to 60 percent acute rejection and metric rejection occurred between 9 to 100 percent and the chronic antibody metric rejection between 64 to 90 percent transplant glomerulopathy in 30 percent to 72 percent graft survival is uh, variable between 4 to 9 to 92 percent and this is during this follow-up from 1 to 66 months. So again, the presence of antibodies against DQ is bad news because it may affect uh, the graft uh, function, uh, graft survival, and increase the risk of um, rejection. Again, I mentioned in the beginning how to monitor antibodies by cell-based and uh, solid uh, phase bead based assay. Here I want just to give a hint about the modifications of solid phase uh, based assay because a pre-transplant evaluation of immunological risk demands a strict interplay between transplant immunologist and uh, uh, tissue typing lab. Clinicians should be aware of assay's limitations and uh, meaning of results in order to request only the most appropriate and useful test. Here, as you see, the uh, routine implementation of Lemonex technology to detect anti chile antibodies. So we have here a classic lab screen. We may have IgM lab screen. Uh, this is another screen, Agnes screen for the specification of C1Q to predict complement binding by surgical testing. It is more complicated test, more expensive, and detect the, the uh, the antibody binding nature of the presence of antibody C for D luminex. So a lot of uh, versions that can help in um, in determining the immunity. And here I am. I, I wanted to comment about the C1Q binding. So C C1Q binding, as you see in this study, this is the censored of uh, antibody mediation free survival according to C1Q binding again C1Q uh, binding is uh, may be important addition and uh, here the C1Q binding they say DNA uh, is associated with inferior outcomes yet not on all patients nevertheless C1Q DNA DSA was shown to be an independent risk, risk factor for antibody mediated rejection and graft loss and it will be a useful tool to stratify the immunological risk of antibody mediated rejection. So this is uh, the first point to this is this is the data documenting the value of knowing C1Q binding of the presence of anti chile antibodies. And this is the data correlating the DQ antibodies and the C1Q here anti chile DQ antibodies and the mean first intensity by lab screen uh, uh, single engine beat are highly and independently independently related to C1Q binding capacity of HLA antibodies. Again, C1Q antibodies is interesting. Another study showing the issue of C1Q binding and IUG subclasses. IUG3 is bad, they say, as well as C1Q binding, they say, both of them were strongly associated with allograft failure. So this is a, an adding value. Another study, which is more recently published in April this year, included 600 patients. And then the, uh, all patients were tested to detect the presence or absence of antibodies. 
absent antibodies in 500 and the de novo DSC in 70 and these are non-donor specific and 40 donor specific and then the other non-donor specific or donor specific antibodies are further categorized into C1Q negative means not binding and C1Q positive binding at uh, complement and this is the same so uh, if the antibody is present either donor specific or not the capability of this antibody to bind C1Q uh, uh, was further evaluated and tested and the result this is a key result if the uh, antibody is not donor specific this uh, was uh, not associated with significant difference in acute rejection here as you see but the major difference in acute rejection in the presence of donor specific antibody the donor specific antibody is further categorized either c1q uh, binding or c1q negative it doesn't differ so the c1q binding here doesn't add anything practically to the issue of donor specific antibody so the key message of this article is to say that it is the only the presence of donor specific antibody and c1q capacity or binding is not essential in this study again this is uh, no antibody non-specific non-donor and this is dsa so the presence of dsa is the major difference but further categorization to c1q binding or not doesn't add anything in the practical points as you see in these data again the we have some data documenting the value of c1q binding capacity knowing the capacity of antigen antibodies to bind the c1q and other data showing the controversy that knowing c1q binding doesn't add uh, clinically to this issue uh, so uh, we should put in mind all these together this is another interesting data about the evaluation of c1q status and the titer of de novo donor specific antibodies as predictors of allograft survival de novo they say that develop after transplantation are independent predictor of allograft loss adjustment for clinical phenotype and an adherence in multivariate models neither c1q status no uh, do de novo non-donor specific were independently associated with allograft loss questioning the utility of these assays at the time of de novo DSA development at present the additional cost and the time associated with these approaches are not justified in routine practice however in cases where an renal biopsy is not possible de novo DSA tighter correlates with t cell mediated rejection and antibody mediated rejection and may assess in risk stratification again and again and again it is better to address the uh, non-adherence because non-adherence here is valid in these uh, models with the, uh, uh, the presence of the uh, here the multivariate model combining c1q status or the nvd sa with non-adherence and the clinical phenotype to predict both the de novo dsa graft loss so again and again the most important in the clinical and subclinical phenotype so this is the clinical increasing creatinine or the uh, the issue of biopsy and the non-adherence is superior to c1q binding assessment another study showing the that there are a lot of technical limitations of c1q single engine uh, beta say to detect complement binding hla specific antibodies so it is not a simple test there is a lot of variability between different lab very expensive and up to this moment there is no uh, uh, sufficient evidence to suggest uh, the use the, and the utility of uh, knowing the the, uh, uh, the complement binding capacity against c1q another study addressing the binding of antibodies de novo dsa regarding c3d binding it seems that c3d binding in this study is more crucial because here if we add to the uh, donor de novo DSA, this is de novo, uh, de novo DSA uh, here the negative, and this is the uh, de novo DSA positive and CD3 positive. So 
the uh, presence of uh, positive uh, de novo DSA plus C3D is more important and crucial in interpretation. Another type of uh, IgM type is IgM type of antigen antibody is important. Well, uh, in this study, this, uh, also it included a few number of patients uh, who were resistant to eclizumab for treatment of antibody mate rejection. And in this study, the presence of IgM antibodies explained the resistance for eclizumab. And the authors concluded that this data, while preliminary, suggests a possible role of IgM DSA in the pathogenesis of antibody mate rejection in patients treated with terminal complement blockade. This data also suggests a testable hypothesis in uh, that monitoring IgM DSA and the preemptive plasma exchange might further reduce antibody mate rejection in eclizumab treated patients. So we may think of all these together, although as you see, a lot of complexity will be added to the immunological evaluation. Another point, which is the DSA types and the type of antibody mediated rejection. We have here difference, uh, different types of anti chile antibodies. Antibody mediated rejection of renal graft occur in two forms. Type 1 and uh, antibody mediated rejection results from persistence and or rebound pre-existing donor specific antibodies. So antibodies are present before transplantation and persistent after that. So this is the type one, uh, this type one uh, antibody mate rejection in size the patients and usually occur, occur, occurs early post transplantation. Type two, here type, type two, uh, usually link it to do novo DSA. There is no anti chill antibody at time of transplantation, but anti chill antibody develops later on. Uh, usually occurs over one year post-transplantation compared with type 1. Type 2 occurs later post-transplantation. As you see, the uh, uh, type 1 uh, in comparison to type 2, type 2 has a worse outcome regarding graft survival. So, and the type 1, here you can find the differences here in type 2 the antibodies is against mainly against the class 2 70 percent and here against type 1 in, in type 1 so this is in type 1 class 1 antibodies and in type 2 class 2 anti chile antibodies and the type 1 has better uh, graph survival than 2 another study shows the same that type 1 occurs earlier and type 2 occurs later uh, uh, and type 1 is associated with preformed and type 2 is associated with de novo DSA. As you see, the graph survival is significantly reduced in type 2, which is type 2 antibody rejection, which is associated with de novo DSA. And again, this uh, study shows the presence of chronic allograft nephropathy and its correlation with the patient outcome. So type 2 with the presence of uh, uh, transplant glioma sig significantly uh, adversely affect the outcome. Again, we may have uh, transcriptomic studies added to the issue of donor specific antibodies. So, if we have de novo DSA plus a natural killer transcript plus interferon gamma uh, production and inducing transcripts. T cell transcripts, all these are associated with de novo DSA that may add to the uh, complexity and to the adverse outcome. So, again, uh, can we, is there any problem in the test? Is there a limitation of the test? Is there a difficulty of the test? A lot of difficulties uh, are already known nowadays. And this is one of the articles which is very important to. Uh, because it discusses the issues and limitations of the detection of anti chile antibodies. So, becoming a chef in the human leukocyte engine kitchen, interpretation and modification of human leukocyte engine antibody assays. This is a very nice comprehensive review that I recommend all of you to read because uh, so one of the key messages of this article is. Unfortunately, not all positive reactions detected by solid phase assay are due to clinically relevant antibodies. Because 
you may have positive anti-chill antibodies in the environment in the lab this is ex vivo and you may imagine that this will occur uh, in, uh, if the patient receives the organ and then you may find the reverse there is no anti chill antibodies or the titer is below the diagnostic uh, value and you can find adverse outcome after transplantation and a lot of explanation can be for these you may have very high mfi but this may be cryptic cryptid engines so the antigen here the antibody agnostic cryptic uh, uh, hidden engines so if you transplant the organ there will be no no harm sometimes you will have very low low levels of main fluorescent intensity because the antibody may react with different anti uh, uh, different uh, beads epitopes and the positivity of uh, main fluorescent intensity depends upon the relative fluorescence so if the antibody is distributed between many beads epitopes this will lead to low mfi so we should put all these together in our mind some of important point resulting uh, here the, we need purification because sometimes on the beat you can find missing hla antigens so not all hla antigens are expressed on the beat the antigen on the beat may be denatured and the reaction the presence of anti chill antibody in the lab may may be to denature the antigen and not natural antigen another point and sometimes if the antibody uh, uh, is a strong in complement binding and fixing the presence of fragments of complement may prevent the reporter antibody because we need the immune fluorescence uh, immunoglobulin igg uh, phycoerythrin conjugate to be to report the positivity if, the, if there are fragments of the, of complement this may uh, prevent the uh, uh, testing and this is known as porozon effects so we should put all these together some lab add editor or edit treated sera to uh, avoid porozon effect porozon negative effect means that if there is any uh, antibody with high complement binding and activate complement this may prevent the detection of other uh, anti chile antibodies. So we should put all these together in our mind while we are interpreted, interpreting the HLA. And this is another personal viewpoint article under the title The Road to HLA Antibody Evaluation. Don't rely on MFI. And the major point uh, here in this personal viewpoint is MFI in the terminology. MFI values were never intended to quantify antibodies because the our dogma is MFI, the higher MFI, the higher the concentration of antibodies. But we should know there is a limitation of this statement because MFI is not approved as a quantitative. It may be quasi-quantitative and not true quantitative. It is uh, maybe semi-quantitative, not quantitative for the, the anti-Chile antibodies. So MFI values reflect a given beads relative fluorescence without reference to a standard so we should put all these all this limitation together uh, as i mentioned uh, in some patients uh, transplanted across extremely high dsa with mfi above 10,000 mfi had not only negative cross match against their donor but also excellent graft outcome there are a lot of intra and inter laboratory variability from reading to reading, maybe the two reagents, maybe to by bed, maybe technology and techniques. All these should be put in mind. So the technique is very sensitive to all these changes and to put in mind. Yes, detection of DSA is very nice step in immunology evaluation to be respected, but not to be uh, uh, looked at alone and we should know the limitations and the consideration this table shows the consideration and the impact here bead and assay related factors the output metric mfi is a continuous variable a clear threshold for positive may not always be identified strongly positive reactions 
are easily identified, clinical significance became less clear at lower intensity. Over calling of antibody may unnecessarily prevent a transplant under calling may result in increased risk. Antibody present despite no prior exposure to HL antigens may still bind the solid feces, say, and you may become denatured in the process of being bound to beads. Exposing non epitopes naturally occurring antibodies in serum may bind to denatured engine, resulting in false positive assessment. Alternatively, clinically relevant epitopes may become hidden and the antibody is undetectable. So we should put all this in our mind. Flow cytometry instrument, instruments requires daily calibration. Factors affecting MFI, uh, 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 so we should look at MFI is best semi quantitative HL engine density varies from bit to bit, non specific binding in the presence of inflammation, etc. Antibody target epitopes that may be shared between HL engine and the bead. Here, the, you can find the antibody may be diluted across beads lowering the detected MFI of any single bead of interest. Analysis of epitope patterns is critical to accurate antibody identification. So a lot of issues related. And this explains the difference of virtual cross-match with the actual, actual virtual cross-match. Virtual cross-match means just to detect the donor-specific antibodies by luminous technology or single engine bead assay. And here, there is a difference between the, this is a virtual, but the true cross-match is to bind the donor lymphocytes with the patient serum and to know the reaction. And here, this table, you can fix this table and read every statement to clarify the difference and the reason for this con con concordance between virtual cross-match and the actual cross-match. So this is a factor, and this is the impact on virtual cross-match interpretation. Here, for example, not all donor alleles are present on single engine bead. If not present, virtual cross-match is incomplete, false and negative risk. So just read all these factors and know the impact on the cross-match. Another interesting point that you can find here, the vendor recommending protocol on single engine beta say, Sierra containing weak HLA antibodies directed against AW4, BW4, panel A, and BW6, panel B, highlighted in red rectangles, were tested by a single engine beta say using either the kit and recommending protocol from vendor one as demarcated by blue color, or the kit and recommend protocol from vendor two uh, as labeled red, or using the kit from vendor one with the recommended protocol of, uh, from vendor two green. HLA human leukocyte engine, mean fluorescent intensity, and single engine bead, you can see here the difference. This is the mean fluorescent intensity, and as I mentioned, this, the blue color referred to vendor one, protocol one, the uh, red one, vendor two, protocol two, and the green one, vendor one, and the protocol two. The, uh, the key message from this figure is the result can differ if we use different kits, or even if we use the same kit by applying different protocol, you can find different results. Another interesting data, if you look here, if this is the same patients, and this is the different technique here, the testing for HL antibodies, anti HL antibodies by the traditional and standard test. And here, after adding editor, the red here, the red color refers to positive anti HL antibodies. As you see here, all these are absent from the first test. Why? Because editor blocks the complement. And so the proson effect, the negative effect of the complement on the beads is. Uh, here is hidden and the anti chill antibodies are detected by adding editor. So editor is one of the solution against the brozone effect. The missing reactivity with several AUCAS engine including mismatched donor HLA engines suggests a brozone effect. This was confirmed by single engine bead assay 
testing following serum treatment with EDITA, showing strong reactivity with the A Lucas engines, expressing uh, the certain ablet. And I'll explain ablet uh, to you uh, just a moment. So again, here I want to stress upon the value of prozone effect. If you have uh, here complement fragment, this may prevent the beads to react with the antibodies and can find here negative antibodies. And if you add editor that block this uh, interaction, the complement fragment with the beads, here you can detect easily the presence of uh, anti chile antibodies with different epitopes. The same here with editor and dilution, it helped a lot to clarify the issue uh, of diluted and adding editor to uh, make correlation between the uh, C1Q and the anti chile antibodies of the serum. Again, all these techniques, adding editor, dilution, all these techniques can help a lot in uh, improving the interpretation of anti chile antibodies. This is another uh, nice review showing that decreasing immunologic risk through iblet matching. What's meant by iblet and epitopes? Yes, the presence of antibody bind certain epitopes in the antigen because the antibody doesn't bind to all antigen structure, but it binds to epitopes, certain epitopes, which are the antigen binding sites on the antigen that the antibody may uh, bind. So the iblet here, if we look here, the, this is a very nice test because here the impact of allele differences in each engine. A small amino acid difference can result in potentially uh, immunologic, immunogenic structural changes in each engines. In this example, both molecules uh, pictured are called each A2 engine protein. However, one is coded A2 locus 1 and the other is coded by A2 locus 3 or allele 3. The amino acid differences are indicated in yellow and the amino acid sequences common between the engine is indicated by blue ribbon structure. An antibody may form to the common amino acid sequence. Here, this is the antibody that may bind the different sequence of A2 here because this antibody is uh, against the common structure in the two alleles. Alleles mean different form of the of the engines. So antibody may be may form to common amino acid sequence. So it is considered an A2 antibody binding to all A2 antigens regardless of coding alleles. So we have common engines and then we have alleles. However, if it is formed specifically to the epitopes defined by different amino acid sequence and allele specific antibody, in this case, to the protein coded by A2 uh, allele 3, this is, a, this is the antibody, is specific to this uh, sequence of amino acids and here cannot bind to this uh, allele. So this is not for the common A2, but it bind to the allele 3. So this is a very nice and important point. Such an allele specific antibody would not be expected to bind A2 allele 1 molecule. So this is this is an important point to be addressed. We may have common antibodies for the certain engine, and we may have a specific antibodies to certain alleles uh, and certain form of so this is the common antibody that bind here these two alleles. This is allele. Uh, one and this is a little um, uh, three, but this is the specific antibody for this allele for uh, A2 uh, allele three and not here for the first one. Okay, uh, another important point just to show the complexity of HLA typing because currently we have high resolution typing that even can look at amino acid sequence. So if we look here. These are three amino acids known as triplet. So the presence of three amino acid sequence within the structure, within the ribbon shape, it is triplet. So three linearly consequent amino acid residues uh, positioning here in this uh, segment. And you can compare this by that. And then 
uh, we have here with conformational changes and uh, uh, rippling of the structure. So here, this is folding of the structure of chili A. So you can find here three amino acids, although they are not continuous, are not linear, but you can find difference here in comparing to that. So this is ablet. So we may have triplet and we may have ablet mismatch. And this further refine the issue of tissue typing. Yes, you may say this is A2 and this A2, but if you look at this conformational points, you can find here some difference. So you may have antibodies binding to this. So if you look by loser resolution, you will find that the tissue timing is typically uh, matching. But if you use high resolution imaging, you may find the difference, as I mentioned in amino acid sequence. Uh, just to uh, um, make it more clear and more simple, you may look from far to, uh, you can say this is a man, but when you come closer, you can say this is Ahmed, this is Muhammad, because you can find difference in shape, although they are men from the far. And this is why we may think of epitopes and uh, in tissue typing. So if you have high resolution and, and you can look at all amino acid sequences and you can find everything is similar, this will improve the tissue typing very much. Because you may have A2 and A2 and you can difference, you find difference in engine sequence, in amino acid sequence that may react with uh, some antipodes. So this is a very interesting point. Another interesting point from the high resolution, which is uh, Birch algorithm. Birch is, it, it is abbreviation of predicted and directly recognizable HLA epitopes. This study included 2,787 cases. Uh, and here, this is, I uh, just want to say that we have HLA matchmaker that determines the difference in B cell epitopes between donor and recipient to estimate the risk of graft failure. These B cell epitopes, designated as epilets, are groups of polymorphic amino acid positions on the three dimensional molecular surface of HLA to which HLA antibodies can be formed. This is for HLA matchmaker. The Birch 2 algorithm determines difference between donor and recipient in their HLA derived T helper epitopes. So HLA matchmaker look at the difference in B cell epitopes, and I mentioned it before, epitopes means the engine binding sites. And the, uh, uh, on the B cell, it is HLA matchmaker, and the Birch score for the uh, T helper epitopes. So again, this T helper epitopes is designated as Birch 2, predicted indirect, indirectly recognizable HLA epitopes presented by HLA DRP1 are involved in the production of HLA specific IgG antibodies. The helper epitopes are required for B cell activation and the IgM to IgG isotype switching. So this study included 2078-7 consecutive kidney transplants performed between 1995 and 2015 without pre-formed DSA have analyzed. De novo DSA were detected by single engine beta assay. HLA epitope mismatches were determined by HLA matchmaker and the Birch approach and correlated in uni and multivariate analysis with tenure graph survival. So uh, here I want to stress upon the high resolution and the thinking of HLA matchmaker and the Birch algorithm. In Birch analysis, the HLA derived mismatched peptide epitopes that can be presented by the recipient HLA DRB1 molecules were calculated using the latest version of the Birch algorithm. So uh, we should look at everything by heart. And here you can find that Birch uh, uh, algorithm and the, uh, is correlating well with the development and predicts the incidence of uh, de novo uh, 10 years of post-transplantation. So this is the merit of this high resolution. The same for HLA matchmaker and the, and the Birch. Uh, you can find the uh, ultimate importance and the higher the score, the higher the presence of 
de novo DSA and here again and again this is uh, DSA and this is the years and this is uh, and this is the death sensor the graph survival of Chile matchmaker the higher the score of matchmaker the higher the risk of the development of de novo DSA and the lower the uh, graph survival and the same for Bershi Bersh scores Bersh 2 the higher the Bersh uh, here the higher the percentage of Dunovo DSA and the lower the graph survival expected. So again, again, so all these are high resolution that may add, yes, complexity to the issue of immunology, but it helps to explain why some apparently mat well-matched couples may have antibodies and graph survival affection. Another important point is to look immunologically at and in the tissue on the biopsy uh, so we combine the immunology and the pathology and put everything on computer to uh, look at the presence of and dsa and the presence of cd3 both of dsa in the presence of uh, uh, macrophages markers like cd68 and all these can be put in computer so computer assess uh, assisted topological analysis uh, of renal graft inflammation at the risk of, ev uh, of evaluation at diagnosis of femoral rejection. So if you combine the serology with tissue pathology, uh, this may add a lot to the interpretation and improve the sequence. Even here, this is the ELU spot, uh, ELU reactive interferon gamma T cell ELU spot. Here it correlates well with de novo DSA. Another issue which is MEF uh, and the PAF genetic polymorphism. One of the characteristics of antibody mate rejection is the infiltration of innate immune system, including macrophage, monocytes, neutrophils, or natural killer cells. Macrophage inhibiting factors and the cell activating factors are well-known cytokines that are associated with activation of innate immune system, which can damage kidney allograft. In this article, the association of the genetic polymorphism of MEF and PATH with the development of DSA, including class 1 and 2 in kidney transplant patients, is investigated. In this study, the DSA were determined by luminex technology and single nucleotide polymorphism of MEF and BAF were determined by the real time BCR. So, this is a very nice test. Here, the, the study included 231 uh, kidney transplant uh, recipients. And here, you can find the correlation of the different genotypes, uh, polymorphism, and the DSA overall, the say after one year, class one, and the class two, and you can find here the difference for certain alleles. So it is important to fax this and, and look at, so the genetic polymorphism of MIF and the BAF may increase the risk of post-transplant development of DSA, and this result suggests that association between the development of post-transplant DSA and the activation of innate immune system is present. Another issues looking at the different, uh, so this is the for MEF and this is for BAF, you can fix and look at the uh, correlation with occurrence of DSA and, F and the uh, either for MEF or BAF. So this is for class one and this is for class two. Again, regarding the use of erythropoietin, it is routine a friend or for this means that the use of erythropoietin after transplantation is stimulate immunity and it can lead to a rejection and inflammation here this study shows that erythropoietin receptor mediated molecular crosstalk promotes t cell immune regulation and transplant survival these find delineate the uh, proto telogenic properties of ebo of ebo in inhibiting conventional T cells while simultaneously promoting T regulatory cell induction and suggest that manipulation of EBO, estrobutene and estrobutene receptor signaling access could be exploited, used to prevent and or to treat T cell mediated pathologies, including transplant rejection. So it seems it is a friend. Regarding the uh, non traditional uh, HLA engines antibodies, here the Unlike the ubiquitous expression of uh, classical class 1 molecules, uh, MIG proteins have limited tissue distribution. 
uh, MIG, uh, this is related uh, to HLA class one. So MIG proteins have limited tissue distribution being, being expressed constitutively on epithelial cells, especially in the gastro and cell tracts, endothelial cells, fibroblast, monocyte, keratinocytes, and dendritic cells. So if you do uh, cross match, the traditional cross match by using donor lymphocytes, it will be negative. Although the, the recipient may have antibodies against the MIKA antigens. So uh, the MIC molecules are not expressed on resting T or P lymphocytes, and unlike HLA class 1 antigens, are not upregulated by interferon gamma. Nevertheless, the expression of MIKA can be induced on activated CD40 cell through release of interleukin 2 that powerfully induces MIKA through calcineurin and other pathways in cooperation with CD3 engagement. The surface expression of MECA is enhanced under stress condition, such as autoimmune disease, any damage, ischemia, repulsion injury, viral infection, and inflammations. Since MECA engine are also frequently found on tumor cells, it implies that they are cell stress markers, and their tissue, tissue expression is a signal for destruction by natural killer cells. Despite clear indication of MECA antibodies, impacting graft outcome adversely, a definitive consensus on the relationship is yet to be arrived and we need a lot of evidence to be convinced by the role of this uh, MECA related antigen. So presence of MECA antibodies and their effect on allograft outcome in solid organ transplantation is summarized in this table here in kidney transplantation. The presence of antibody against MECA antigen pre-transplant, post-transplant for the kidney here, three months, one year, and you can see here the correlation with increasing antibody immediate rejection, etc. Again, I want you to know, just know that the uh, traditional cross match doesn't detect the MECA, the antibodies against the MECA, and it needs special test may uh, be uh, for detection of the uh, this type of antibodies. Regarding the uh, non HLA antibodies. Detrimental actions of uh, donor specific antibodies directed right, against both major compatibility antigens and the specific non HLA antigen expressed on the graft antelium are a flourishing research area in kidney transplantation. Although the more strong evidence is to our detection of anti HLA antibodies and not non HLA antibodies, because the majority of non HLA antibodies are hidden antigens. The uh, uh, sorry, non HL engines are usually hidden, so and they are expressed under certain situations. And some of the important an uh, antibodies against non HL antigen are antibodies against type 1 receptor and in cellular type A receptor. Um, here, these uh, this is the, dif the different structures non HLA uh, that uh, may uh, stimulate immunity. And here uh, you can just uh, fix and lock. This is extracellular side, and this is the intra uh, so this in the blood, and this intracellular side. This is FLT3 ligand, angiotensin type 1 receptor, angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor, uh, endo uh, glean type endothelium type A receptor, ICAM4, and this is the LG3 and the cleavage uh, prelican. So all these are angin for them. Antibody can be formed and you can have some experimental evidence of significance. This is uh, another study showing that in kidney transplant recipients with rejection and no donor specific antibodies against HLA, a higher incidence of antibody with rejection and worse inflammation scores are ob observed in the presence of positive pre transplant antibodies against angiotensin 2 type 1 receptors. So, uh, and this is another study showing the, uh, this data, uh, the association between non HL antibodies detected in the uh, endothelial cross match and the anti body agonist angiotensin uh, type 2 and uh, angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor ELISA. They uh, show the antibody meat rejection correlation with antibody meat rejection. And as you see here, the higher the level of antibody of angiotensin, uh, two type 1 receptors. If it is uh, higher than 17, you can find in here uh, the uh, higher percentage of antibody mate rejection. It's the same for the presence of positive uh, endothelial cross match, the higher the percentage of patients with, anti with uh, antibody mate rejection. Another interesting point is the 
angiotensin type receptor and not antibody. It is receptor. This study shows that pre-transplant angiotensin uh, 2 type 1 receptor. This is not antibody, this is type, this is a receptor. Doesn't, didn't predict the risk of antibody mediated rejection. However, the receptor spiked during early antibody mediated rejection and the sustained elevations were associated with poor outcomes. And here you can find the difference in the here, the uh, higher level was in comparison to normal for those uh, uh, who have uh, uh, had persistent uh, uh, antibody response. So this is for uh, antibody rejection free, and this is for antibody rejection before one year and after one year. Again, as I mentioned, pre-transplant uh, angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor didn't predict the risk of antibody mediated rejection. Another study about the anti-endothelial cell antibodies in this study, uh, 150 cases on the, uh, antibodies against all these endothelial antigens. Another study showing the emerging importance of non-HLA antibodies in kidney transplant uh, complication. This is a very interesting point because, as I mentioned, the antibodies may be hidden and it can appear under stressful conditions like ischemia refusion engine. This simulate antibodies and this lead to autoantigen exposure, autoantibody recruitment, complement activation, and tissue damage. Here, the anti lg 3 autoantibodies enhance the renal microvascular injury, post ischemic uh, ischemia refusion in native and transplant kidneys. Renal ischemia refusion leads to an intimal microvascular damage, which enhances the expression availability of cryptic antigens, hidden antigens such as LG3. Circulating anti-LG3 reaches these antigenic targets and promotes further microvascular injury. At least in part through complement dependent mechanisms, microvascular damage leads to peritoneal capillary dropout and enhanced renal fibrosis. So again and again and again, there is a major difference between HLA and non-HLA because HLA engines are present over all over the cells, so the reaction will be strong. And we recommend testing against HLA antigens by detecting anti-HLA antibodies, but we don't recommend up to this moment because we have no convincing data to test routinely for non-HLA antibodies. If there are guidelines, this is the guidelines that was published in 2015 regarding uh, and they try to answer important questions in immunological evaluation in renal transplant candidates uh, what uh, HLA engine and non-HLA engines could be defined in addition to HLA, A, B, and DR. The uh, guidelines recommended performing human leukocyte engine, DQ, DP, C, typing of the donor only when the intended recipients has HLA antibody against them. Why? To know if these antibodies are donor specific or not. So just uh, recommending doing the routine HLA, B, and DR, B1, and then if there are a lot of antibodies detected by luminix technology, we can uh, review the touch type of the donor to know is this antibodies are donor specific or not. The guidelines don't recommend the routine typing for major histocompatibility complex one related chain MECA and other non HLA antigens in either the recipient or donor. As I mentioned, there is no convincing data to test for non HLA engine or antibodies. In the transplant candidate, what technique of course match should be used to optimize outcomes? Uh, uh, they, uh, they recommended performing complement dependent cytotoxicity course match in a HLA sensitized patient to prevent hyperacute rejection. And the presence of positive T cell CDC cross match is an absolute contraindication for transplantation unless the patient is desensitized by desensitization technique. Uh, the guidelines suggest that in HLA antibody negative patients, with negative regular um, screening samples, a cross match can be omitted unless a potential HLA sensitizing event has occurred since the last uh, screening. We usually do at least three cross match, initial cross match, and in the midway and final cross match immediately before transplantation. This is our practice at Urogen and Free Center Mansoura. Uh, the guidelines don't recommend performing aluminex or inocular cell cross match because their additional value need further evaluation. And I am convinced by that. We, the guideline recommend that a positive CDC cross match should only be accepted as totally positive 
when donor specific antibodies are known to be present. Here, I want to add a comment on this uh, recommendation. If we have negative CDC cross match and you have positive TSA, we should repeat the cross match by enhancing techniques. And if we have positive CDC technique and the donor specific antibody uh, appears negative, we should be sure of the technical points of limitations of the test and we can repeat the test because this may be an alarming. So if we, if we repeat the test and everything is fine, so we can know our pathway. Here, the, uh, the new addition the, the, in, this, in this issue, they uh, recommend the comprehensive typing of recipient donor is required to determine the presence of HLA DSA and determine the SA specificity and recognize the SA limitations. And it's better to think of the issue of epitopes and the high resolution tissue typing instead of low resolution by serological methods by using the advanced molecular typing uh, to know the exact uh, tissue type to avoid synthesization later on because of the higher the matching and the lower the mismatch at the epitope level the uh, the superiority of the outcome so, so the less the mismatch the higher the su superiority of survival this is from heidelberg this is the uh, recommendations of Heidelberg uh, since uh, October 2016, pre-transplant termination of the immune activation marker soluble CD3, SCD3 uh, in ELISA has also become an important component of pre-transplant risk estimation in measure uh, uh, one of Heidelberg algorithm because pre-transplant activation of immune system as measured by high SCD3 levels was in two recent studies of 80 very sensitized high uh, risk patients from Heidelberg and 385 very sensitized patients from 13 transplant centers. So, this is a real addition in the uh, immunological workup. So, if you look here, this is the pre transplant identification of high risk donor independent CDC, BRA, DTT, HLA class 1 and 2 antibodies, donor dependent positive CDC cross match, most of CDC T cell cross match, DSC above 1000, so all these are criteria and here you uh, you can find the addition of soluble CD3 which denotes the immunological activation. And this is how they uh, treat, so this you can read all these data to know the algorithm in Heidelberg. One of the advantages of knowing the presence of anti chill antibody to put in mind the evolution in biopsy because Sometimes when we do biopsy at the time of DSA, you may find nothing or you may find subclinical event. But with repetition of the biopsy by surveillance biopsy, you may find pathologies. So de novo DSA is associated with antibody mediated rejection and allograft loss. Yet the allograft histology associated with de novo DSA remains unclear. The aim of this study was to examine the allograft histology associated with de novo DSA in patients with serial surveillance biopsies. Moreover, 94% of patients received a biopsy after DOVDSA. Antibody mate rejection was present in 25%, and 52.9% of patients had DOVDSA detection in one year, respectively. So, uh, the presence of anti and the, the development of DOVDSA may refer to the presence of immunological process that needs to be uh, followed uh, hardly. We should maintain immune suppressive drugs and we may think of uh, surveillance biopsy because you may find a great difference here. Uh, here the, the color code, uh, the blue one for uh, the graft uh, failure. The, uh, this is the color of for graft failure or 50% decline in GFR. And this is the gray one for acute active antibody rejection and the uh, yellow color is the chronic antibody mate rejection. If you look here with no DSA, you can find all of these are low, but with the presence of de novo DSA, uh, this is if critically bad news because everything bad increases because of the presence of de novo DSA. Even you can find silent DSA, silent uh, antibody mate rejection. This study included 86 patients DSA positive kidney transplant recipients subjected to protocol biopsy who were identified upon cross-section antibody screening of 741 recipients 
with a stable graft function at six months or longer after transplantation among the SA positive study patients, 44, this means 51% had antibody mutant rejection, 24 of them showing C4D positive rejection. Combined analysis of antibody characteristic in multivariate models didn't improve antibody mutant rejection prediction. Conclusion, this study uh, showed that 50% uh, prevalence of silent antibody mutant rejection occurred with the presence of DSA and he concluded that the assessment of uh, main force intensity IgG, antibody IgG, IgG MFI may add predictive accuracy and this finds suggests the physician should be both a realistic impression and you can follow up these patients to know how to do okay so this is the uh, the core message 51 percent of the patients with DSA may have uh, silent and the most important point in this study is the correlation of fibrosis with the CA course of interstitial fibrosis and tube atrophy over time according to circulating anti human leukocyte and gene donor specific antibody status post transplantation based on evaluating 5551 biopsies performed within 1000 days post transplantation so here, the development of DSA is associated with increasing risk of fibrosis. And you can look here, the minimal if without DSA, attaining the uh, best survival. And here, severe if with DSA uh, was associated, are associated with uh, worsening of the graft survival. This is the last point. Uh, uh, do we like sensitization, desensitization or not, or living patient dialysis. The old article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016 showed advantages of the doing desensitization. So this is the effect of desensitization of survival is better than leaving the patient on the waiting list or on dialysis. So here, this is a New England paper uh, recommend doing desensitization to proceed for transplantation. But the new data coming from the Lancet paper, HLA uh, incompatibility kidney transplantation, this is a core message. HLA incompatible kidney transplantation in the Kingdom co uh, confers no greater risk to patient survival than awaiting a compatible living or disease donor alternatives, but doesn't confer a survival benefit either. So this uh, means that uh, the, the issue of desensitization is uh, controversial and this is, was highlighted and summarized as nephrology digest under the title Are Sensitized Patients Better Off with a Desensitization Transplant or Waiting on Dialysis? This is a very nice question and they harvested the data from New England and Lancet paper and they st stated that sensitization to human leukocyte engines remains one of the major clinical challenges for successful kidney transplantation. Two large observational studies has recently, have recently addressed the question of whether individuals are better off with a desensitization treatment followed by HLA incompatible living donor transplantation or waiting on the deceased donor kidney transplant list for a compatible transplant. The conflicting results of these two studies largely, largely reflect differences in the study design and the study population, leaving clinicians to make decisions about desensitization based largely on local expertise and anticipated waiting times for a compatible disease donor transplant. So this is the harvest. And this is another issue of uh, the effect of desensitization. Uh, here, despite the higher incidence of antibody immediate rejection, HLA incompatible and EBU incompatible kidney transplants showed a favorable uh, graft and the patient outcome after desensitization therapy. And here, the death is higher with incompatible transplantation. It may be due to the infection and the issue of desensitization is not an easy task here in this study even the use of 32 doses of portezomib on eight waves each wave is uh, four injections four infusions 
and this uh, schedule was very expensive and uh, may be intolerated by side effects. So again and again, the issue of desensitization by using antibody therapeutics, plasma pharesis, and IV IgE may be uh, very risky, very expensive, and it cannot, may not succeed. However, this may be the only solution for a patient to find a, a, trans, uh, a transplantation to improve the patient's quality of life and in some cases to improve survival. Here the rituximab that is used in the desensitization regimen may even flare the hepatitis uh, B for patients with hepatitis B serves only negative and uh, core positive, this anti-core positive, the uh, hepatitis B uh, infection may flare because of the use of rituximab as you see here. This is a reactivation in the rituximab versus control and this is a cumulative rate of hepatitis B reactivation. As you see, this is for anti-hepatitis uh, B is um, uh, negative and this is uh, uh, positive. The, the absence of anti-hepatitis B is anti antibodies is associated with uh, higher reactivation and the presence of the, in this, so rituximab may increase the flare of the hepatitis B. Here the high dose of IV IG therapy to do uh, desensitization. Uh, this data suggests the, uh, that the use of IV IG uh, here in this study, the treatment with high dose IV IG alone in real transplant recipient with de novo DSA doesn't result in any significant clinical or immunological benefit. Here, the study uh, addressed the issue of intravenous immunoglobulin therapy in kidney transplant recipient with de novo DSA, a result of an observational study, so it is expensive, and the preliminary data are not encouraging to use the IV IG for the presence of de novo DSA. Again, the presence of de novo DSA should be followed up. We may think of protocol biopsy, and the most important point is to keep the immune suppression without any withdrawal or any reduction. We may keep the acrylamus level a little bit higher, and we should be careful to do biopsy uh, immediately if there is any allograft function to early diagnose and treat antibody mediated rejection. The solution may be in the kidney bird donation, and this may be viable to the patients to find more compatible uh, couple instead of doing desensitization. And it seems that it may be a solution, but uh, this uh, solution needs a lot of efforts for legal and administrative policies. I should stop here by the statements of William Osler. He who studies medicine without books, sales, and uncharted sea, but he who studies medicine without patients doesn't go to see at all. This means we should read, learn, and uh, gain experience with dealing with the patients. We shouldn't stop learning because once you stop learning, you start dying. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to receive any question on my email. Thank you very much.